morning church. Um, let me just find my passage. So today's teaching text uh, comes from Acts chapter 8, verses 4 to 25, and I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said as they listened and saw the signs he was performing. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was, a, so there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon had previously practiced sorcery in that city and amazed the Sumerian people while claiming to be somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least of them to the greatest, and they said, this, is this man is called the great power of God. They were attentive to him because he had amazed them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ. Both men and women were baptized. Even Simon himself believed. And after he was baptized, he followed Philip everywhere and was, and was amazed as he observed the signs and great miracles that were being performed. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. After they went down there, they prayed for them so that the, Samarit so that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit because he had not yet come down on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter told him, May your silver be destroyed with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part nor share in this matter, because your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, your heart's intent may be forgiven. For I see you are poisoned with bitterness and bound by wickedness. Pray, for, pray to the Lord for me, Simon replied, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. So, after they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they traveled back to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. For those who I have not greeted, greetings. For those who I have not met, my name is Reino. I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor, and I also have the privilege this morning of opening up the word with you. Really excited about what God has in store for us. Currently in a series, we call it Acts Season 2, and this is how we do it. We work through a Bible book. We ask you to follow along. We send out our scripture reading for the week beforehand, because sometimes we cover really, really big portions. So episode 1, which is two weeks ago, we only covered seven verses. Last week, we covered two chapters. And today, we're covering another longish, biggish piece with a whole bunch of movements in it. The first week we spent looking at challenges in the church. The church has grown, priorities have shifted, ministry had to be shared, the apostles had to be wise, what did they do? That's what we studied in the first week. Last week, we looked at what it means to be Christ-like, to be like Jesus, to act like Him, to be in His image, to do what He did, to be like Stephen. And we saw the powerful effect of Stephen doing as the Messiah did. Just by the way, if you want a really ripping summary of the whole Old Testament, read Act 7. It's Stephen's sermon. But he tells the story and interprets it in light of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. It's absolutely phenomenal. And we also saw last week that the first real big wave of persecution has hit the church. Now, let's just back up a few verses. Go back to your Bible. It's not on the slides. And let's just see what happens in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Saul agreed with putting him to death. This was Stephen. 
And on that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. This is what's going on in the book at the moment. There's a huge plot twist. Okay, It does ring a bell, though, if you think back to chapter 1. You will receive power, and you'll be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. So if you listen closely in chapter 1 and you follow the story along, you'll go, wait, 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 wait. Someone said something about Samaria back in the day. Now it seems like Samaria is back on the map. If we pretend to not know the story, which I think is sometimes meaningful if you read the Bible, like read it as if you've never heard it, then this is quite a crisis. This is one of those things that happens in the story that you wonder, oh my word, what is going to happen next? You know when you watch a series and it ends on a cliffhanger uh, episode, you go, oh! I don't have time to watch another episode, but I am, I'm just going to watch the beginning just to see what happens, and then it's another full episode. This is where we are in the story. Something has happened, and it's actually quite a crisis. Now, I just want to lay out the rest of the season for you. It's not a spoiler alert. It's just to encourage us to push through. You know when you watch a new series and you hit one of these crises and you say to your friend who recommended the series, dude, I don't think I'm going to continue. What do they say? No, dude, listen, it gets better. Just push through this. It's not the end of hope. It's only episode three. It is going to get better. You will see at the end of the series. So here's what I want to show you. This is where we are headed um, for the rest of this season. Another six episodes to come. Now, can I have the slide of the Bible Project drawing, please, Rudolf? Here we go. So we are going to finish the season at Acts chapter 12. And these chapters are all about, look top left, how the mostly Jewish-based community of Jesus became a multi-ethnic international movement. This is the arc of these chapters in the Bible. And then you'll see Philip in Samaria is a key part to the story. The conversion of Saul of Tarshish is also an important part. Then you'll see a huge block of teaching that we'll work through that has all to do with Peter the Apostle and a Roman citizen called Cornelius. And then you'll see a description of the church that is multi-ethnic, absolutely beautiful. Paul is on the scene with his, uh, with his guy Barnabas. So this is where we are headed. So this is the beginning of a very important part of the story, and it is how it got from Jerusalem all the way through to being a multi-ethnic international movement. Okay, so let's push through it. It's a hard piece of scripture, but you'll want to watch this episode. Here's our map for today. Thank you, Rudolf. Now you can put that up for us. Three points, really simple. The mission continues. A contrast and a choice. And the Holy Spirit will not be abused. That's what we're going to look at today in this portion of scripture. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump right in. Lord Jesus, we love the story of your church because we realize that we are a part of it. And uh, this was the beginning of something that has lasted over the last 2,000 years and something that will last until you come back. And we deem it as a privilege to be part of it. Thank you that we can gather together around your word now. I pray, as Kuliso prayed earlier as well, that you would soften our hearts, that we would accept your word, that we would be teachable and that we would be formed by you. I pray against any distractions and things that might take our minds away from you, from your good news, and from the scriptures. May this time be an edifying and inspiring time for us. Talk to us, Lord Jesus. We are listening. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, so first stop for today. The mission continues. So, Rudolf, I'm going to ask you to keep the slide up of the teaching text with my bold and underlined. So guys, the bold and the underlining is mine, and I want to see, I want to show you that there's quite a lot going on in these first couple of verses. So we're going to chat about scattering, preaching, proclaiming, paying attention, and then the great joy that was in that city. Okay, the mission continues. Plot twist, crisis in the church, something hard is happening, people are dying for their faith, but 
the mission continues. Why? Because the people were sowed or sown like seed to go and grow and bear great fruit. Remember, guys, that Luke is a writer and Luke, R Luke is very clever. And Luke is piecing together a story for us that is one big coherent witness to what Jesus did and how the church continued to do it. He uses this word intentionally. That word scattered is also the same word that's used in Greek for sowing, right? So scattered doesn't mean that they were just chased away. Scattered means that they were sown. So if you sow something, what do you want that thing to do? You want it to grow. If you sow something, what does that thing do first? It dies and then it multiplies. Do you guys see the rhythm? So even though the people of the uh, church are being sown, there'll be some growth. Even though the people of the church are dying, they'll be multiplying. So Luke is playing with words here, really, really clever. And he's telling us that these people who were being sown, who were being scattered, kept on sharing the good news. He uses two words for that. He says they were preaching the word and they were proclaiming the Messiah. The best way possibly to translate that into English is they were sharing and they were announcing. Sharing personal. Hey dude, there's free burgers at Steers. Announcing, there's free burgers at Steers. Whoever wants one. They were doing both. And they were sharing not only news, they were sharing good news. You guys see the difference? There's burgers at Steers. That's news. There's free burgers at Steers. Well, that's good news. At least to me. Okay, if Steers is not your thing, then choose your favorite burger chain. Point is, they were sharing and announcing the good news while being sown, while being asked to die, while being sent out to a place that they did not want to go, they kept doing what they were called to do. Let's pause here for a second. Where are you now? Are you where you want to be? Are you living the perfect life? Are you living your best life? Have all your dreams been realized? No. Ne uh, that wasn't the case with them either. But they embraced it. Guys, Samaria. Read the Gospels. No Jew wanted to go there. Jewish people didn't want to mix with Samaritan people. Jesus continuously shook the cage of the Jewish people by using stories and then talking to either Samaritans or talking about Samaritans. I don't want to be here. This wasn't part of my one, five, or ten year plan. This isn't where I thought about investing in property and retiring. So, they still embraced it and they kept on preaching the good news. I think that's a question worth asking. Where are you now? And even if you feel displaced or scattered or not where you want to be, does that have an impact on how you are embracing that situation and how you are continuing to share the good news? Because they had good news to offer and they kept on sharing it. So what was the good news? I think this is really important. The Word and the Messiah. That was the content of the good news. The content was Jesus Christ, historical figure, who actually lived, actually died, actually rose from the dead, actually ascended to heaven, and actually made good on His promise to send His Spirit to be with people and to help them interpret all of His teaching and to guide them, to comfort them, to give them power and to lead them to do greater things than Jesus did. That was the content of their preaching. It was facts. So, they shared it. And announced it with confidence. Free burgers at Steers, guys. Listen, free burgers at Steers. Free burgers at Steers, guys. Listen, gents, just want you to know, free burgers at Steers. Why? Because I've been there. I've had one, and two, and three, and as many as I could eat. And it's really brilliant, and it's a fact, and I'm going to keep on sharing it with you. That is what they shared. And they shared it for the purposes of God's glory and for the salvation of other people. Look at verse 7. 
They listened. They saw the signs he was performing. It led to great joy. And those signs either showed God's glory, or it saved people, or it did both. That's why they kept on sharing it. Do you guys see the reason for staying faithful to the mission, even though you are not where you want to be? The reason is not about you. It's about something and someone else. So I'm in Samaria. I don't want to be here. I was pushed here or so near to die so that the church could multiply. But I'm going to keep on sharing the good news because God needs glory and people need saving. That's it. It's got nothing to do with my own comfort or my own accomplishments. Because verse 7 says that God was glorified. And verse 7 says that people were saved. And verse 8 says that that led to great joy in that city. God is stronger than demons? Well, let me show you. God is stronger than illness? Well, let me show you. God is stronger than death and sin? Well, let me show you. Here you go. It was proven to us by Jesus Christ and the fact that he was raised from the dead. That he was risen from the dead. That was the content of their preaching. And that was the purpose for their preaching. The power is in the gospel. The power is not in Philip. That's really important to see in this portion of scripture. Because we'll see that Simon has different ideas a little bit later. Now let's again just pause here for a second. I'm in Samaria. I'm not where I need to be or want to be. I know that I have to keep on preaching, sharing and announcing this good news of the gospel. How am I going to do it? Guys, I think if it was me, I would have thought lights. I would have thought stage. I would have thought HD video. I would have thought little reels or boomerangs on Instagram. I would have thought Facebook stories, movies, effects. That's not what they did. Simple and powerful. God loves you. God is stronger than. God died for you on the cross. Free burgers at steers. Do you guys see the facts? That is what they shared. And it was simple and it was powerful. Because there's power in the gospel. The mission continues. The theme for today, the gospel will not fail. We believe in a gospel that can't fail. And then it led to great joy in the city. I think I'm hungry because food illustrations keep on popping up. Or Lesecho is just imprinting on me. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Guys, think about that moment that you hook someone up with food that you love. You guys ever done that? Like, you ate something or had something. One of my most recent uh, examples coming to mind is when Mike took me to Burden Co. Before we moved into Burden Co., Mike said to me, this will change your life. And I said, okay. Guys, as I was lining up my first bite, Mike was leaning over the table. Why? Because he wants to see me enjoy what he has enjoyed before. And even before one could actually savor the flavor, he goes, it's good, huh? it's good, it's absolutely good. It is changing your life now, isn't it? And then if you do that to someone, and they go, oh, it's, it's all right, then you go, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. Let's try again. From the top, okay? Like, I need you to lean into this. Why? Because I'm excited that you are going to experience the same thing that I did. I'm excited for your joy that will come from it. There was joy in the city. And that's why they kept on sharing it. Because they want people to experience the same thing they did. Philip is single-minded and is faithful to his calling. Why? Because the gospel can't fail. With the same confidence that Mike took me to his favorite new chicken place, Philip shared the gospel. Because it will change your life, and I know it. Because the power is not with me. It doesn't matter where I am. It's facts, and I'll see it breaking through. And guys, verse 7 is a revival in Samaria. Like, just that verse is a description that I would love to see come through. Now, here in Centurion and in South Africa. John MacArthur, I don't think I've ever quoted him, but I am going to quote him now. He says, sow the seed and go to sleep. 
Preach the word and let God do the work. We have to have that confidence in the gospel. Because the power is in the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember that someone shared the good news with you? If you are a Christian here today, if you are a believer, I want to ask you that question. And do you remember how life-giving and world-changing it was? I sat with the pastor, and after confessing all my sin that I could think of for almost two and a half hours, he said to me, have you heard of grace? I'll never forget that moment. It was really sweet. And I experienced something there. And I should remember that there are people who still need to experience that. The mission continues. Whether the church is scattered or not. Whether you are where you want to be or not. Because the power is not in you. The power is in the gospel. Point two. A contrast and a choice. Now, there's a showdown going on here. Not the first showdown in the Bible, and definitely not the last, but we should read this as a fight between two different parties with two different methods. It's actually like a boxing match. Now, let me show you the slide of this portion of Scripture. Just look at all the bold and underlining. There's a lot going on here. Okay, so we'll get to all of those, but track with me. There's quite a lot we have to look at. So, Maybe a good way to state it is there's three subpoints in this point. Okay? It's not more points, it's just subpoints. There's a difference in the practice of Philip and Simon. There's a difference in the persuasion of Philip and Simon. And there's a difference in power when it comes to Philip and Simon. Okay, so those three Ps are just it, it helps us to just read this portion of scripture. Okay, so the difference in their practice. Is Philip is all about the word, Simon is all about the wow. Do you guys see that? Okay, look at it. Philip proclaimed the good news, Simon was claiming to be somebody great. Do you guys see the difference there? So Philip is a guy of the word, Simon is a guy of the wow. Look at persuasion. Philip is someone of simplicity. Look what he proclaimed. The good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. That's really simple. Look at Simon. He practiced sorcery. He was claiming to be somebody great and he was going for the sensation. They were attentive to him because he had amazed them. Do you guys see that they used totally different things to persuade people? Philip's persuasion was in the simple truth of the good news, the gospel. Simon's wasn't. And then if you look at the power, there's an interesting dynamic here. Philip has the power in the gospel, and he says it's for everyone, right? So he gives it away. In the next slide, you'll see as we continue through the portion of Scripture, the apostles come to make sure that they also get the Spirit. Because they're not going to keep it, because it's for everyone else. It's a gift. So we're not keeping the power. We're not hoarding it for ourselves. It's meant to be shared. Simon wants it. So that he can own it. So that he can decide what he wants to do with it. It's a stark contrast between these two characters. Now, the word and the well, simplicity and sensationalism. Philip has it and says it's for everyone. Simon wants it so that he can keep it for himself. A good question here to ask yourself, if you just look at this portion of scripture as a mirror, is who do you want to be? Are you in it for the word, or are you in it for the vow? Are you in it because it's simple, or are you in it for the sensationalism? As the pastor of this church, I can tell you that people have told me, and Lesachor, and maybe some of our other leaders before, that they are leaving us, because it's just not that wow for me. Like, I just, it's just that I need something a little bit more. It's just too simple. It's just too plain. Now, I've got respect for that, because there are many other churches that you can go to if you want to. But whenever people say that, I wonder if your faith will be sustained, if it's always about the wow. Because sometimes faith isn't wow. But it's always simple, and it's about God showing His love to us in Jesus Christ. Just think about that. 
We didn't plant this church to be a wow church. This church shouldn't be about the sensationalism and the power preachers in their suits, making people feel awesome when they, move, when they leave here. This church is a gospel-centered, disciple-making, transcultural church. That's who we are. It's really simple. And it's not about sensationalism. And then also, if you think about power, like God's power is for everyone. God's power is not to be used or manipulated. That's the third point we'll get to. So which one of these two postures do you choose? Which one of these two postures do we choose as a church? Because both individually and corporately, we have to make this decision. That's why I love preaching through a book. I wouldn't have chosen this portion of scripture if I had to preach this Sunday. But it's great to preach through it now because I look at it and I go, hmm, this is a very interesting mirror for me. The reason why I'm talking about sensationalism, simplicity, word and wow, is because it might be different in our church because we're a family. But guys, the culture outside of this church is all about influences. It's all about networks. It's all about names. It's all about exposures. It's all about you having to know some people or have to have the right education or have to have the right friends or the right friends will lead to the right opportunities, will lead to the right networks. We have this culture of fame and fortune that keeps on throwing that message at us. And then that message comes into the church. Then the church wants to be famous. Then the church wants to be influencers. Then pastors want more followers on Instagram, etc., etc. It shouldn't be that way. Keep it simple. Keep to the word. And let the spirit be the power to be shared with all people. Now, quick sidebar here. Just opening up a new window. <whistles> Let's just ask the question quickly. What's up with the spirit? Because if you look at the next slide, you'll see that... The Holy Spirit had not yet come down on any of them. And then you see this little commentary in brackets that Luke writes in there. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I can't just glance over this and say nothing about this. Let me tell you what I think is the best interpretation of this portion of Scripture. Luke is writing a story, okay? And this story is headed somewhere. Do you guys remember the long arrow that I just showed you for chapters 8 to 12? So Luke wants to be really clear that the Holy Spirit in Samaria is the same Holy Spirit as the one in Jerusalem. Nothing second rank, nothing lesser, nothing fake. It's the real deal. So as Luke is writing this story, he wants to make sure that as we read it and we see that the Spirit of God is coming down on more and more people, that it is the same God and that it is the same Spirit. And that the apostles are all in on this plot twist and radical new way of viewing the church. Luke wants to make sure that as a reader of the story, that we see that it's the same spirit in everyone. We'll see this again. When Peter is at Cornelius' house, he prays for them. And then the spirit comes down on them in exactly the same way that it did in Acts chapter 8 and that it did in Acts chapter 2. And then Peter will go back to Jerusalem and then he'll say to the people, you wouldn't believe it. God poured out his spirit in exactly the same way as he poured it out on us, on other people that are not like us. Guys, this is absolutely phenomenal. We have to embrace this. It's radical, it's new, and it's shocking, but we have to do it. That's why Luke makes sure to write to us that Peter and John from Jerusalem came through prayed over those people, and they received the same Holy Spirit. Now, Luke says they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, meaning they had confessed their faith in front of other people to say, we believe, like we've seen it, and now we place our faith and trust in it. So he makes sure to show that these people have already confessed their allegiance to Jesus. Now, if you confess your faith in Jesus, you do receive the Holy Spirit. But then if you look at this portion of scripture, it seems like there's like a step one and a step two. There is no step one and step two. But Luke wants us to make sure that we see that this isn't a fake spirit or a different spirit. It's the same spirit. And that's why in the book of Acts we'll see that again. There'll be moments where the spirit will be poured out in exactly the same way as in the beginning of the book of Acts. So the writer makes sure as we follow the story along that we see it's the same spirit 
coming down on people in exactly the same way, empowering them in the same way, having the same effect. Okay. Third point, the Holy Spirit will not be abused. Now, you guys have heard, T's and C's apply. Anyone? Like, I think you probably heard it 10,000 times on a radio in a day. Now, T's and C's can sometimes be tricky because you don't actually read the T's and C's. And then when you are taken by surprise of something that happened, they say, oh, yeah, yeah it, it's in the T's and C's. And then you go, why is this fine print? It's supposed to be bold print, dude. Your telephone will not be insured against water damage. Anyone? Like you take out insurance on your phone, you drop it in the water, and then they say, ah, yeah, sorry, dude, snap. It wasn't covered against water damage. And you go, why didn't you write that in bold? Because that's the thing I want coverage on, <laughs> you know? So here's bold print. It's not fine print. Your faith can fail. Your faith can fail. The gospel can't fail, but your faith can, and I'll show you how. You have to believe the right thing, and you have to believe it for the right reason. That's really important. Look at it. Last slide, please, Rudolf. M uh, verse 21. Your heart is not right before God. Verse 13. Even Simon believed. And he was baptized. You guys see it? So Simon believed. Simon was baptized. Simon followed along but for all the wrong reasons. This is really important for us. We have to believe the right thing, and that is the gospel, the love God showed to us through Jesus Christ. But we have to believe it for the right reason. Otherwise, your faith will fail you. Simon's faith failed him because he believed in something for the wrong reasons. He was called out, we'll get back to it, and he never repented. Pause. Where are you today? If I would ask each and every one of us now, like take the mic, why do you believe? Not what do you believe. Why do you believe? What is your answer? Just think about that. Because this portion of scripture begs the question. I'm going to give you my answer. I believe because I was overwhelmed by God's love for me. Period. Like, I couldn't resist it. I had to take it. Like, I saw a Savior on a cross, beaten, mocked, scoffed at and scorned for me with open arms. The, nothing in my life has been more beautiful than that. And that's why I believe. Like, proper job, that is why I believe. Illustration. I can use my wife for this illustration. Check this. Watch. That's it. That's why I believe. I saw God the Father hanging on a cross with open arms and going. And, and I couldn't resist it. I, I, I could not. <laughs> like my wife couldn't resist me now. <laughs> but it is Father's Day. You know, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. I couldn't resist it. There was nothing more beautiful than that. I just, I had. I had to, I had to take the hug. Like, <laughs> one hug and all resistance crumbled. <laughs> Quoting the flake ad. Why do you believe? Because we have to believe the right things for the right reason. Faith is a gift. And it's meant to be received. Do you see the flaw here? He offered them money. You can't by a gift. It's meant to be received. God gives us the gift of faith. We grip faith by taking the leap of faith. That is how it works. And that's the gospel. 
God has taken the initiative from His side to fix our broken relationship with Him by offering His Son as a sacrifice for reconciliation between us and Him. He opened up His arms. He said, come. It's a gift and it cannot be bought. See, here's the problem with Simon. And here's why I'm saying that his faith failed him. Because faulty faith loves sensationalism. Faulty faith loves the wow. Faulty faith loves to be amazed. Question, what are you going to do when the wow is gone? Faulty faith loves commercialism, uh, commercialism and benefit. I can benefit from faith. Because if I ask God for whatever I want, He's going to give it to me. That's why we preach against the prosperity gospel. There is no such thing as God will give you everything you want. That's not how it works. He's the driver, we're the passenger. He's God, we're His kids. He's the king, we serve Him. That's how we start. And then we ask Him for whatever we want. What happens if you don't get what you want? I faced that crisis of faith early in my life. After I got converted, I watched a lot of prosperity theology because that was, that's the only thing I could find on the telly. And it was such a great affirmation of all my dreams. Like I wanted to live in Woodhill, Tuscan Villa, blonde wife, Ferrari, Learjet, CA that taught business rescue for high corporates. Like that was my dream. And every afternoon at one, I would watch someone till half past one and then till two and then till 2.30. And three sermons in a row, they would tell me that God's going to give it to me. And I was like, this is pretty neat. Like, I thought I was going to have to work for this. I am clever and I am studying accounting and I am going to become a CA. But I'm just going to go, God, the Villa ooh, and the Ferrari, let it be a 360 Modena, Coupe Cabriolet. That will be really phenomenal. Simon was in this for commercialism. Simon wanted something from this. And then also, I, I don't know if this word exists, but selfism or self-centeredness maybe. Simon wanted to be someone. And he lost his status in Samaria after Philip came. Do you guys see the story? Everyone went, ah, Simon is the man. And then Philip rocks in and people goes, he's got the power. And Simon goes, whoa, snap. I'm not the flavor of the week anymore. Like people don't think I'm cool anymore. I need a new power play. I need something new that will draw people to me. They're now following Philip, and I've lost that, and I want it back. What I want you to see is that sensationalism, commercialism, and self-centeredness of Simon leads to a hammering from Paul, ach, from Peter. Peter hammers Simon. He gives him a rollicking. He gives him a hiding. He gives him a head washing whatever word you want to use, he comes down unbelievably hard on him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will not be abused. The gospel and the gift of faith and the gift of the Spirit will not be abused. It's not for your use. It's for His glory. It's not owned by you. It's given by Him. And that's a really, really important thing we need to see in this portion of scripture. Okay, and then lastly, look at the bold and underline. So after all was this, uh, after all this was done, they testified, they spoke, and they preached. Isn't it just a great finish to this amazing portion of scripture? It's called inclusio, if you look at it from a literary perspective. It starts with some, something, and it ends with something. And those are like brackets around everything. Do you guys see it? So in verse 4 it says, they were scattered, they were preaching, and they were proclaiming in Samaria. And in verse 25 it says, they testified, they spoke, and they were preaching in Samaria. All of this that happened between these two brackets is what happens when you testify, preach, announce, share, and herald the good news. Peter hammers Simon and then goes, okay, we're done here. On to the next one. And then they just keep going. Right? So we had to deal with the person trying to steal the free burgers at Steers. 
But now that we've dealt with him, free burgers at Steers, free burgers at Steers. Guys, free burgers at Steers. They're just going to keep going. Because the mission continues. There's a contrast and a choice we need to make. And I need to remind you today that the Holy Spirit will not be abused. Amen. I'm going to ask San Marie to lead us in a response song. And then I'm going to read a benediction for us. I'll uh, do a prayer for us after the response song. No, I'll do a prayer now. Pray for us now. We'll respond in song. And then I'll read a benediction for us. So we had many pauses today. We spoke about where we are at the moment. And if we are still sharing the gospel. We spoke about the power being in the gospel. We spoke about the joy we experienced when we heard the gospel. We spoke about trusting in the gospel. We paused and spoke about who do we want to be, Philip or Simon. We spoke about our culture that's different than the church. We spoke about why we believe. So there was a lot of pauses in today's sermon. Let's just take a minute. Let's just reflect on those pauses. And then I'll do a prayer for us. Lord Jesus, we want to be like Philip in Samaria. We want to trust the gospel because we know that it cannot fail. We want to be people of the word. We want to keep it simple. We want to receive your power and share it with others. We don't want to be in this for the wrong reasons. We want our hearts to be right. So help us today to clarify these things. Give us a new um, urgency to share the gospel. Give us a new clarity on why it is that we believe this in the first place. Give us a great courage and openness to just speak it as simple as it is. Because it's a story that was given to us, that we put our faith in and it changed everything for us. Give us a vision of a city that experiences joy because of your gospel being shared. Give us a vision of a church that keeps on sowing and preaching and proclaiming, regardless of where we are and how we're feeling. We want to be like our brothers and sisters in Acts. Shape us that way. Empower us. Correct us if needs be. Transform us. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen.